it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. I graduated from high school a few years back. Still live with my parents, but I'm using this time to my advantage. They're kind enough not to charge rent, and that allows me the ability to save up almost every penny I make. The hope is that I can one day start up a small but legitimate business and move into my own apartment. You know, the American dream. You see, much to my parents' dismay, I don't have a steady job. I prefer to take a DIY approach and be my own boss. I buy and resell things online and take odd jobs here and there to supplement my income. With the help of social media and Craigslist, I am able to regularly mow lawns in spring and summer, rake leaves in autumn and shovel driveways in winter. And eventually I'll make enough to buy a decent car and reach clients outside of town, maybe even hire a few lackeys. But what I'm here to share with you, however, is an incident that occurred almost two years ago, one that keeps me on edge to this day. In my first year of business, I introduced a flower delivery service. Depending on the season, I'd either pick up flowers from around town or buy them from a local florist, then deliver them to a person of my client's choosing. Though it wasn't my most popular service, it did bring in some good money. You'd be surprised how much folks are willing to pay to woo a loved one with plants. But in all the time that I bike flowers back and forth from person to person, I only ever picked up one regular. His name was Red, and he was absolutely infatuated with his girlfriend, Clara. Once a month, I'd deliver a dozen roses to the local hotel where she worked. No matter how many times I went over there with the same bouquet, she always acted surprised and delighted to know it. They really did have something special, and I was happy to be a part of their lives, in at least a small way. But then, February rolled round. Albeit my least popular job, to gain a little traction during the Valentine season. Along with the additional customers, Red goes all out and has me deliver three bouquets on the week leading up to the holiday. Between these deliveries and keeping up with my usual services, February beats the hell out of me. Well, this particular Valentine's week was a little different. It was getting close to the big day and I hadn't received a single order from Red. I usually don't get attached to my clients, but I was quite fond of Red and Clara. And because of this, I decided to reach out to him. I tried calling him. No dice. Nothing but dial tones and voicemail. I thought about riding over to the hotel to ask Clara about it, but that would have cut into the rest of the work I had lined up for the day. With no viable options available to me, I simply went about my day and kept a positive mindset. Something felt off, but I was sure it was nothing to worry about. Well, the next day, Reg called back. He was fine, but... There was something he wanted to discuss with me. Of all the phone conversations I've ever had, this one tops the list for most bizarre. Red hadn't ordered any flowers because he was getting ready to pop the question to Clara. He wanted the lack of gifts that week to leave her confused and then catch her completely off guard on V-Day by asking for her hand in marriage. I was happy for them, but that's when the conversation took an unexpected turn. Red didn't have a ring. He was wealthy and could afford whatever jewellery he wanted, but not just any engagement ring would suffice. Oh, he wanted his mother's ring, the one his father had proposed with. It was the only one he felt that was fitting, the only one worthy enough to be wrapped around her finger. There was just one problem. His mother was buried with it. And then came the weird part. Red offered me $10,000 in cash to dig up his mother's grave and retrieve the ring from her dead finger. He said he'd do it himself, but he didn't have the nerve. He couldn't bring himself to defile her gravesite like that. Well, he wasn't exactly comfortable with me doing it either, but he truly felt this was the only way he could propose to his one true love. Oh, I pleaded with the guy. I really did. I told him to go to Jared's. I mean, women love rings from Jared's. Seriously. But alas, he wouldn't budge on the matter. Whether it was the allure of money that I could use to expand my business, or the desire to help out a desperate friend in need, well, I grudgingly accepted the job. I'm not going to make any excuses here. I know you think I'm crazy for doing it, and yes, I most certainly was. 
I know this now. Well, I knew it then too, but have you ever looked back on something you did in your past and wondered, what the hell was I thinking? Well, this is one of those moments for me. And try as one might, you can't go back and change the stupid shit you've done. Well, this is something I'll just have to live with. Under the light of a full moon, I biked over to the cemetery. As conspicuous as the shovel protruding from my backpack looked, I managed to make it the whole way, without any trouble. After passing the black entrance gates, I laid my bike down and set off on foot. The graveyard was consumed by a little winter chill and an uneasy silence. My footsteps cut through the crisp night air, creating echoes that danced from headstone to headstone. I turned back from time to time and told myself it was to check for passing cars, but really I was afraid of ghosts lurking in the shadows. I never really believed in them, but being surrounded by hundreds of buried corpses in the middle of the night can do a number on your psyche. Growing more nervous with each passing moment, I trotted to the back of the cemetery in haste. My hurried pace was soon impeded by a fresh pile of white marble, upon which was etched the name... Abigail Grovewood, in a stunningly elegant font. This was it. This was Red's mother, right where he'd said she'd be. It was time to get down to business. In the hopes of saving at least a little bit of face, I'll say that, in this moment, what I was doing did feel deeply wrong on a moral level. I was about to vandalize and rob the grave of a deceased stranger. And she didn't deserve this, and I very well knew it. How would I live with myself knowing that I'd disturbed her peaceful slumber? Well, the question had a simple answer. With ten thousand dollars in my pocket, and that's how. I'd come too far to turn back, and I foolishly felt that this was the best way to further my financial endeavours. May God have mercy on my soul. The whole process only took about six and a half hours, a little less time than I'd expected. I suppose shoveling driveways every year prepared me for this pivotal yet strange moment in my life. After all was said and done, I looked at the coffin below and panted profusely. Despite being utterly exhausted, I had no time to waste. Daylight was on its way and I had to get the hell out of Dodge before it shrouded the land of the dead. With how narrow the hole was, there's no way I would open the coffin by conventional means. Adding insult to injury for poor Abigail... I had to use my shovel to break through the confines of her deathbed. Eventually, I desecrated the entire cover, allowing me ample room to retrieve the ring, no matter which hand it was on. Victory was within reach. Now, before taking my prize, I looked down at the woman I was about to steal from. The sight of her corpse was a grotesque one. She'd only been buried for about a year, so her flesh had not fully decayed yet sat on her skin like batter on an undercooked drumstick. To top it off, maggots crawled around every inch of her surface. <sighs> it was sickening. Just as I was about to reach past the flesh-eating bugs and grab Abigail's hand, something crazy happened. Well, it was dark, that's for sure, but I swear I saw her begin to sit up in her grave. The movement was subtle, but it was enough for me to take notice. I was startled but it took a few seconds for the gravity of the situation to sink in. When it did, I became so spooked that I hightailed it out of there without a second thought. And that is the gist of my late-night adventure. <laughs> Pretty lame, right? I went through all of the grief just to chicken out at the last minute. Pathetic, I know. But you weren't there to experience it. As I climbed out of the hole, I thought I felt something brush against my ankle. Perhaps Abigail's brittle hands attempting to pull me to my death. As I ran to my bike, I pictured her crawling out from her earthly tomb and chasing me down the road until I was inevitably captured. This was the single most frightening night of my life. I was scared shitless and I didn't give a flying fuck about Red or the $10,000. I just wanted to get the hell out of there. Of course, upon arriving home, logic set in and I realised the error of my ways. It was entirely possible that Abigail was as still as stone and I only thought I saw her move. When I fell against my ankle was probably more likely maggots crawling up my pant leg. 
I had let the eerie atmosphere of the cemetery get the better of me, and was now out ten grand and a good friend. Just my goddamn luck. I almost went back, but the sun was beginning to rise. I couldn't risk being spotted and going to jail, but that was a likely outcome regardless. Instead, I wallowed in self-pity and ignored Red's calls for a couple of days. Soon enough, my failed grave robbery was all over the news. But here's the thing. When the police discovered my handiwork, something was profoundly amiss. Abigail's casket was empty. There is an old dust-covered road on the outskirts of Bakersfield that leads to the long-forgotten town of Nadinia, California, where the demolished buildings line the shattered concrete, stretching past the frayed town sign that used to house its name, and where rusted windmills creep to life beneath unyielding winds. Many within the neighboring cities would attest that the town was never more than a vacuous ghost town their recreant remarks roused by the grief-stricken tales passed down by their ancestors. His forgotten memories forcibly buried below the rubble and battered skeletons of abandoned brick structures and stripped machinery. For those who chose to acknowledge it, the bitter memory of lost souls are forever etched into their subconscious, and the horrendous past of Nadinia lives on. The town's downfall came at its peak, amidst the installation of its first streetcar. Those who could not afford to journey north to San Francisco opted to travel its bounded rails, drifting past horse-drawn buggies and cross-wing construction. The trolley's popularity grew with the wandering curiosity of the neighboring counties, soon becoming a bustling tourist attraction. But as all good things do, its unbridled fruition soon came to an unrelenting end. On the 12th of April, 1898, a series of fires ravaged the town, killing over 700 civilians. Poverty ravaged the land, and those who survived soon deemed the town cursed, eventually abandoning what little possessions they'd left for a new life elsewhere. The stench of burnt flesh and terrified howls still quiver along the chilled winds, leaving the souls of the dam behind, and forging the town into a permanent afterlife. As a historiographer, I find myself often drawn to the enticing lure of historical cities, and after learning of the buried treasures and execrations it's said to hold, I quickly opted to travel the 14-hour trip to uncover its secrets myself. Despite my foreboding curiosity, the fear of the unknown left me a bit weary. I had no idea what sort of horrors awaited me, nor what breed of inhabitants I was sure to encounter. Word of drug peddlers and moonlighters occupying the area left a more sour taste than apple cider. Regardless, I pressed on, deducing that the risk was well worth the reward. Several hours into my trip, the paralyzing threat of fatigue soon swept over me, lowering my lids like sunken anchors over my eyes. The bounteous amount of coffee and energy drinks I guzzled were beginning to lose their potency. Nonetheless, I elected to continue against the lull of sleep having already traveled the majority of the trip. Sleep would only deter my initial excitement. As I gulped down my last energy drink, I could see the faded town sign languidly creeping towards my vision. As I rounded the corner onto the dirt road, a chilling screech erupted through the air, and a blinding white light quickly followed, slicing through my eyes like wetted needles. As my arms tried desperately to cloak my eyes from the devil's light, the sound of screeching tires drilled into my ears, 
and before I could regain control of the wheel, a thunderous jolt knocked me unconscious. A few hours later, I awoke slung across an omnibus terminal, my last memory being a dashboard view of the dirt road that led me here. My shirt was shredded to rags and dried blood caked between the seams an obvious remnant of the scars that lined my forehead and cheeks. I had no recollection of how I ended up there, nor how far my comb and host state allowed me to tread. I fixed my eyes upon my surroundings, quickly taking notice of the noisy inhabitants I was once so wary of, none of which, resembling their dangerous counterparts, I was warned about before traveling. Most were cloaked in bulging cotton garments reminiscent of the 1800s, their children garbed in clothing more aged than their maturity. Either I had stumbled upon the set of an old western, or the new residents really strived to embody the town's rich history. I continued looking around, taking in the sights of old cathedrals and Victorian-styled architecture. It was truly marvellous. I was one of the very few who braved the trip to this seemingly dangerous and cursed city. I watched on as children played in the street, while the adults conversed amongst each other, wondering why so many feared to travel here. As I scanned my eyes over the area, a darkened shadow washed over me, dimming my vision. I looked up, and the iconic streetcar was parked right in front of me its doors partially ajar. I was dumbfounded. How did this thing survive a fire from over a hundred years ago? After closer inspection, its charged and desquamate exterior suggested that the newfound squatters had been intelligent enough to get it running themselves. Despite my curiosity, I had no need to come aboard, at least not yet. I waved it away, stood erect and sauntered off in the opposite direction. Ever since, uh, the damn thing's been tailing me on and off for hours, like a starved puppy looking for an arms of sprinkled dog biscuits. I wasn't alarmed at first, but most vehicles restricted to rails couldn't partake in such behaviour. As my curiosity swelled, I began keeping a mental note of its passengers each time it passed, causally cataloguing every man, woman and child aboard. There were never more than three to five passengers at any given time, and on most occasions none at all. Eventually I began counting the seconds it took to make its round approximately 30 minutes before making a full cycle. A pretty short trip for a town as large as this. There was something very strange about this mysterious trolley. Something that I was now hell bent on finding. As it began to make its next round, I quickly ducked behind a buggy positioned against the sidewalk. I waited for it to pass then immediately followed closely behind, careful of being spotted. It made multiple stops before rounding the corner into a blind alley. I abstained from proceeding any further, unsure if misplaced tracks led it astray. To my bemusement, it continued its advancements, seemingly unknowing of the approaching dead end. I braced myself for the impact, waiting to hear the grating sounds of sheet metal searing against the stone surface. I waited, but heard nothing. Only the immobilizing embrace of silence greeted my doddering perseverance. I slowly regained my composure, scouring the area for any sign of the trolley. Not a puff of smoke nor the shattered remains of metal sat where it once tread. It was as if some magician had used it in an elaborate stage show. Without the continuous howls of electrically powered rails traversing overhead, 
I finally noticed how quiet the town had become. Only the low growl of street lamps interrupted its hushed ambience. Something was odd. Just a few hours ago the streets were filled with light, and now it seemed like I was the only one left. Before I could jump to any conclusions, a low rumble resonated from the direction the streetcar had vanished in. I unwillingly crept closer, oblivious to what might happen next. The rumbling grew louder and louder before a familiar white light beamed into my retinas. The sound of rotating cables pierced through the air, and the iconic streetcar once again bestowed its presence. I watched as it pulled up beside me, its doors creaking open ever so slightly. I stared with a look of confusion. Why did it want me to come aboard so badly? I slowly ambled towards it, scaled the narrow steps, and stepped onto the soot-stained tiled floor. I looked around carefully, examining each passenger, feeling my blood run colder with each glance. What sat aboard the trolley sent cold shivers down my spine. The passengers all stared blankly in my direction, their skin blotched with dried blood. Sickening blisters and deep lacerations riddled their bodies, some still excreting sanguinesque fluids. Gaping holes occupied areas of seared flesh, exposing fractured jaws and visible grey matter. The stench of decaying flesh forced vomit up my esophagus. I swallowed hard, turning towards the driver for any explanation for what I was witnessing. The sight of him left me in a cold sweat. I was even more terrified than I had been before. Beneath his ebony cloak, like the face of death, a luminescent red light glowed from within its sockets, while tiny maggots danced inside its skeletal orifices. I wasn't sure if this was real, or the town's version of a practical joke, but I wasn't planning on sticking around to find out. I turned towards the door, preparing to run, when I felt the icy grip of fleshless bone clash tightly around my wrist. It pulled back with incredible force, but I wasn't going to accept the fate of death so easily. I twirled around, connecting the sole of my foot with the side of his temple, then leaped from the trolley as he screamed out in pain. Before I could even get a running start, he lunged towards me, tackling me to the ground. He gripped so tightly onto my ankles and began pulling me back aboard the trolley. I tried desperately to loosen myself from his grip, but his brute strength undoubtedly surpassed mine. I couldn't allow myself to be dragged back onto the travelling nightmare. I had to do all I could to break free. I jolted violently beneath his grasp, digging my nails into the shattered concrete below. I could feel my ankles slipping from his hands. The moment I felt fingers retract, I shot up from the ground and darted in the opposite direction. I ran as fast as I could, creating as much distance as I could between us. What the hell was going on in this town? I tried to cook up a viable explanation, but all of my theories managed to conjure more questions than answers. I continued running, hoping to stumble upon my car on that dirt road, running for what seemed like hours before finally reaching it. When I arrived, the townspeople were all huddled together. Something, or someone, was holding their focus. I forced my way through the muttering crowd, 
curious to what had held them all so entranced. As the dirt road came into view, that all too familiar sense of terror engulfed what little hope I had of ever escaping. My car had crashed into a large pile of rubble just beyond the town's entry. My risky habit of rarely buckling my seatbelt forced my body to propel itself through the windshield. Broken shards of glass and a fractured spine would cause my demise. I walked closer towards the vehicle, staring at my exaggerated reflection with utter horror. My appearance could not differed much from those aboard the trolley. I turned slowly towards the others, watching their worried expression turn to those of rage. Their murmurs grew from quiet whispers to howling shrieks. I quickly covered my ears, trying desperately to shield them from their horrid cries. As their shrieks grew louder, a sea of flames erupted around us, engulfing the city in a reddish glow. As the flames drew near, one by one, the physical forms of the townspeople slowly dispersed, leaving only their battered souls behind. A frozen look of dread crept onto my face as I watched their ethereal flesh catch fire, their screams burrowing deep into my subconscious. I now understood what that streetcar was for, and now, more than ever, I had regretted my decision of ever leaving. It is said that in Ulthar, which lies beyond the river sky, no man may kill a cat. And this I can verily believe as I gaze upon him who sitteth purring before the fire. For the cat is cryptic, and close to strange things which men cannot see. He is the soul of antique Egyptus and bearer of tales from forgotten cities in Miro and Ophir. He is the kin of the jungle's lords, and heir to the secrets of hoary and sinister Africa. The Sphinx is his cousin, and he speaks her language. But he is more ancient than the Sphinx, and remembers that which she hath forgotten. In Ulthar, before ever the Burgesses forbade the killing of cats. There dwelt an old cotter and his wife, who delighted to trap and slay the cats of their neighbours. Why they did this I know not, save that many hate the voice of the cat in the night, and take it ill that cats should run stealthily about yards and gardens at twilight. But whatever the reason, this old man and woman took pleasure in trapping and slaying every cat which came near to their hovel. And from some of the sounds heard after dark, many villagers fancied that the manner of slaying was exceedingly peculiar. But the villagers did not discuss such things with the old man and his wife, because of the habitual expression on the withered faces of the two and because their cottage was so small and so darkly hidden under spreading oaks at the back of a neglected yard. In truth, much as the owners of cats hated these odd folk, they feared them more, and instead of berating them as brutal assassins, merely took care that no cherished pet or mouser should stray toward the remote hovel under the dark trees. When through some unavoidable oversight a cat was missed, 
and sounds heard after dark. The loser would lament impotently, or console himself that by thanking fate that it was not one of his children who had thus vanished. For the people of Ulthar were simple, and knew not whence it is all cats first came. One day, a caravan of strange wanderers from the south entered the narrow, cobbled streets of Ulthar. Dark wanderers they were, and unlike the other roving folk who passed through the village twice every year. In the marketplace they told fortunes for silver, and bought gay beads from the merchants. What was the land of these wanderers, none could tell, but it was seen that they were given to strange prayers and that they had painted on the sides of their wagons strange figures with human bodies and the heads of cats, hawks, rams and lions. And the leader of the caravan wore a headdress with two horns and a curious disc betwixt the horns. There was in this singular caravan a little boy with no father or mother but only a tiny black kitten to cherish. The plague had not been kind to him. It had left him this small, furry thing to mitigate his sorrow. And when one is very young, one can find great relief in the lively antics of a black kitten. So the boy, whom the dark people called Menace, smiled more often than he wept, as he sat playing with his graceful kitten on the steps of an oddly painted wagon. On the third morning of the wanderer's stay in Ulthar, Menes could not find his kitten, and, as he sobbed aloud in the marketplace, certain villagers told him of the old man and his wife, and of sounds heard in the night. And when he heard these things, his sobbing gave place to meditation and, finally, to prayer. He stretched out his arms toward the sun and prayed in a tongue no villager could understand. Though, indeed, the villagers did not try very hard to understand, since their attention was mostly taken up by the sky and the odd shapes the clouds were assuming. It was very peculiar, but as the boy uttered his petition, there seemed to form overhead the shadowy, nebulous figures of exotic things, of hybrid creatures crowned with horn-flanked discs. Nature is full of such illusions to impress the imaginative. That night the wanderers left Ulthar and were never seen again. And the householders were troubled when they noticed that in all the village, there was not a cat to be found. From each hearth, the familiar cat had vanished. Cats large and small, black, gray, striped, yellow and white. Old Cranon, the Burgermeister, swore that the dark folk had taken the cats away in revenge for the killing of Menace's skittles and cursed the caravan and the little boy. But Nith, the lean notary, declared that the old cotter and his wife were more likely persons to suspect, for their hatred of cats was notorious and increasingly bold. Still, no one durst complain to the sinister couple. Even when little Atal the innkeeper's son, vowed that he had at twilight seen all the cats of Ulthar in that accursed yard under the trees, pacing very slowly and solemnly in a circle around the cottage, two abreast, as if in performance of some unheard of rite of beasts. The villagers did not know how much to believe from so small a boy. And though they feared that the evil pair had charmed the cats to their death, 
They preferred not to chide the old cotter till they met him outside his dark and repellent yard. So Ulthar went to sleep in vain anger. And when the people awaked at dawn, behold, every cat was back at his accustomed hearth, large and small, black, grey, striped yellow and white. None was missing. Very sleek and fat did the cats appear, and sonorous with purring content. The citizens talked with one another of the affair, and marvelled not a little. Old Crannon again insisted that it was the dark folk who had taken them, since cats did not return alive from the cottage of the ancient man and his wife. But all agreed on one thing, that the refusal of all the cats to eat their portions of meat, or drink their sources of milk, was exceedingly curious. And for two whole days the sleek, lazy cats of Ulthar would touch no food, but only doze by the fire or in the sun. It was fully a week before the villagers noticed that no lights were appearing at dusk in the windows of the cottage under the trees. Then the lean Nith remarked, that no one had seen the old man or his wife since the night the cats were away. In another week, the Burgermeister decided to overcome his fears and call at the strangely silent dwelling as a matter of duty, though in doing so he was careful to take with him Shang the blacksmith and Thule, the cutter of stone, as witnesses. And when they had broken down the frail door, they found only this. Two cleanly picked human skeletons on the earthen floor. And a number of singular beetles crawling in the shadowy corners. There was subsequently much talk among the burgesses of Ulthar. Zath, the coroner, disputed at length with Nith the lean notary, and Cranon and Shang and Thule were overwhelmed with questions. Even little Atal, the innkeeper's son, was closely questioned and given a sweetmeat as reward. They talked of the old cotter and his wife, of the caravan of dark wanderers, of small menace and his black kitten, of the prayer of menace and of the sky during that prayer, of the doings of the cats on the night the caravan left, and of what was later found in the cottage under the dark trees in the repellent yard. And in the end, the Burgesses passed that remarkable law, which is told of by traders in Hartheg, and discussed by travellers in Nier, namely, that in Ulthar, no man may kill a cat. If you've ever seen someone endure a seizure before, or been the unfortunate sufferer of one, I don't need to tell you how horrific it is to be a part of. And if you haven't, count yourself lucky. There are few things in this world more mentally scarring than seeing another human being convulsing on the floor as their eyes roll into the back of their heads, their jaw clenched and their joints rigid as they shake, or, oh, if you're very unfortunate, writhing around and even dislocating joints as they search for new ways to bend and snap. All of us have seen it in the movies, sure, but it pales in comparison to the real thing to actually stand there as someone's brain is stuck on repeat and their body is a slave to the misfiring signals as you woefully stumble around, unsure if you're supposed to put something in their mouth to stop them biting their tongue, 
Spoiler alert. No, never. Call an ambulance immediately, or just leave them to it. Imagine that feeling of helplessness in front of a stranger, and then compound the grief by tenfold when it's your entire world, and you've just gotten home from work to find them writhing on the ground for the seventh time this year. Your first thought isn't ambulance, medication, or anything like that. No, it's to check that she hasn't smashed her skull on the coffee table, that she's not choking on her own vomit, and then to make an educated guess at how long she's been seizing for. No epileptic wants an ambulance called every time this occurs, so you have the unenviable task of timing their suffering before calling one, usually about three to five minutes. This is my reality, and one that I will willingly bear if it means that I can save her as much as she's saved me over the years. Lucille is a bright, vibrant, and unbelievably creative soul. She is capable of painting the most incredible pieces of landscape portraiture while telling a crass story that would make even a dominatrix blush, a voice that bounced in your skull long after it had finished its journey into your ears. And she has a zest for life that had me head over heels from the moment we met. What she first saw in a geeky kid who loved family and nights staying in more than extravagant parties is beyond me. But I never stopped being my true self from the first conversation. And I guess it just stuck. Which is why now is so fucking hard for me to deal with. Why I'm coming to you all here to talk about this. I'm telling you all this because I want you to understand that Lucille was special. To me, she was my everything. Someone I would move heaven and earth for. People say that all the time. But so few mean it. I would do things that I'd let haunt me with a smile for the rest of my life if it meant hearing her say she loved me one last time. Understand, I'm just a man doing right by his wife, or at least trying to. Coming here helps. Maybe it's part therapeutic and part guilty conscience. I hope by the end of this, you'll understand where I'm coming from. Lucille was first diagnosed with a tumour in the fall of 2017. We'd been married for three years and she'd been steadily suffering absences in her memory for around six months leading up to the first seizure. To begin with, it was the usual tip of my tongue moments we all get. Then it progressed to forgetting her keys and being locked out for an hour after finishing work. It grew into more concerning things like nearly setting fire to our kitchen as she would go and take a bath with the stove on before the final straw came along and she neglected to stop at a red light after forgetting to hit the brakes and careened into an electrical pole. When the police found her, she was gripping the steering wheel so tight with her jaw clenched so hard that they worried she was suffering a psychotic episode. The adjustment to her condition was, well, tough. Doctors rarely have great bedside manner at the best of times. And when our physician advised to either go on a $145,000 treatment plan with 25% success or look into hospice care ASAP, and that the Swiss are nice people if we never thought about dignitas, well, suffice to say, my wife stormed out and resolved to use her artwork to ensure she never forgot the game. Her determination was anything but dampened. I dare say it pissed her off. So... Like any good husband, I supported her and ensured that, at the very least, she got her medication while she tried her own art therapy. She would start painting small, innocuous icons on sticky notes around the house. Things like a yellow sticky note next to the front door, with a slew of creative iconography reminding her to get her keys, and a doodle of her standing under a stormy cloud outside, if she forgot or a picture of a pill bottle with overly happy faces on a blue note by her bedside cabinet and in the bathroom to ensure she got her daily dosage of anticonvulsants. For a time, he's actually helped, and I'd get used to finding small notes around the house, even for me, little reminders of her love in the form of short messages like, I love how much you laughed with me today, or I appreciate you giving me a neck massage after the last siege and it never stopped being a welcome sign. 
Those first couple of months convinced me that she was going to beat this. She would overcome it and sell her story to Time magazine and become a therapist of the century for her groundbreaking discoveries on memory retention. I'm sure you all know, however, that we rarely ever get what we want. It was the late summer, and I'd been working away a lot more than I wanted. As an architect, I took whatever contracts I needed. Medical bills are seldom ever totally affordable in this freaking country. Even with insurance, our deductible was still high. So the contract I ended up taking was nearby if anything went wrong, but far longer hours than I was used to. I'd been working a particularly lengthy afternoon. When I came back to the sounds of grunting and snapping, finding Lucille's fragile form on the ground and next to the coffee table where her head had made contact with the corner before landing on the ground and nestled in a pool of her blood. You have to understand, we took every precaution. and sharp edges or areas she was likely to hit if she seized were always far away from her. The table was in my personal study room on the second floor and the rubber corner protectors were taken off of it. I rolled her over and soothed her as I'd done many times before, calling 911 the moment I spied blood. Thankfully, they were over within minutes and took her into the ambulance. But unlike so many other times, she was not coming out of this one. Now, as the title suggests, she continued to seize as they strapped her down, her joints flailing and smashing against the EMTs, the metallic walls of the ambulance and anything they could find until she was mercifully sedated. You should get her things. It's not likely she'll be coming home tonight. One of the EMTs called back to me, sweat dripping off their brow after finally putting her down. I knew the drill by this point, but it was still painful to hear. I nodded and told him I'd follow on as soon as I gathered everything. Heading back into the house, I realized I hadn't noticed some of the extra sticky notes dotted around the living room, leading to the edge of our stairs. They weren't placed on the walls, but instead hung by a thin black thread that Lucille must have pinned from end to end in strategic places on the house. Wondering if she'd documented how she felt and if it was potentially relevant to her physician, I grabbed the nearest one and read it. Don't forget. You'll be making contact at 4.42 p.m. sharp. Wear loose clothing and do not take your meds. A small stop sign with a blind eye in the center peering back at me. Why the hell would she tell herself not to take her medication? Confused, I went to the next one a few feet away and felt the hairs on my neck stand on end as I did so. He's offered me a deal. I can explore more of his world if I give up one month of my lifespan each time I enter it. it. Seems fair to me. He called it the Decadent Plane. Must remember that next time. Oh, and to call him the Fringe God. He didn't like being called a black man. Next to this one were two small drawings. One of Lucille's body floating around pillars of steel and light with a huge mat at the center. The other simply writing the words, Fringe God, over and over, progressively getting more scratchy with each consecutive entry. Hands shaking, I frantically ran through the living room and up the stairs to our bedroom, grabbing as many notes as I could in the process. Concern for how far her mental state had deteriorated was building within me as I scanned each entry. Today I had a seizure. In the process, I got to dive deeper into the amorphous golden shroud and see the beauty that dwelled within. I want to remember it, but I'm too nervous to even write it down. I gotta stop taking my meds. Too much interference. Maybe I could paint some of it. Tried painting the visage of the nocturne one. His crown too beautiful for me to even put onto canvas. I tried to speak his name aloud, and I ended up with a migraine. Picturing him in my head just made me cry. It hurt so much, but I could not wait to get back there. Today was special. 
The fringe god gave me a better offer than before. I swear the nocturne one wept from beneath his flesh mask as the offer was made. If I did exactly as he said, I'd be able to explore the inner sanctums of the decadent plains and gain knowledge I could bring back with me. I have to remember these plans when I get back. I looked at the final drawing and I felt sick. She'd drawn steps for how to cause bleeding in her brain and a seizure so strong that it would effectively kill her if I hadn't come home when I did. More drawings were strewn across her canvas. But I had no time to peruse as my cell phone rang and I realized how much time I'd wasted in the apartment. Mr. Loomis, it's Dr. Mitesh. If you aren't already on your way down, you need to get here immediately. Your wife, she... Arriving at the hospital and apologizing profusely for my terrible parking on the curb, I rushed in and headed straight for the neurology ward. Notes tucked into my pocket as I tried my best not to bump into other visitors. My mind focused on one thing, Lucille. I turned the last corner and I heard the screaming before I saw the stuff. It was filled with pain and terror. It absolutely belonged to my wife. Spotting a nurse leaning against the window, I approached him and tried my best to keep my composure. My wife... Mrs. Loomis, is she here? I breathed, my eyes darting to the foreboding double doors, back to the obviously shaken up nurse. He tried to be professional, but whatever was going on was far beyond his experience level. She's not stopped seizing since we got here. We've tried sedating her several times, but it's not doing her any good. I'm sorry, just, the screaming got too much and I had to take a breather. The doctor should be out for you soon. Excuse me. He rushed past me and I chalked it up to nerves in the new environment. Waiting around for half an hour and staring at the notes did nothing to calm my nerves. Nor did Dr. Mitesh when he finally came out and ushered me to a waiting room. He explained to me that she wasn't just having one continuous seizure, or at least he didn't think so but was instead having consecutive seizures one after the other without any rest. I've honestly not seen anything like it, he began, hands rubbing each other as he spoke. I've tried to get a scan of her brain, but, well, not safe, right? I chimed in, fully aware that any person mid-seizure is a liability. My wife may be small, but she packed a punch at the best of times. Right. We've upped the dosage to bring her to a calm state, but it seems to wear off quickly. I've requested our head of neurology, and hopefully she can shed some light on this. In the meantime, you're welcome to sit with her, but I must apologize in advance for the straps. He saw my eyebrows raise and clarified. This is a precaution, I assure you. We've just managed to fully put her under, but we don't want to take chances or have her cause more harm to herself. He leaned forward. We will get to the bottom of this. I promise you. He led me back into her room, and for the first time in what felt like weeks, I looked upon my poor, broken wife. Her face was bruised up from the knock she'd taken as she fell, head bandaged up with gauze, and her face scrunched up in a permanent grimace. Never cease to horrify or hurt me to see her body after it's been through an ordeal such as this. Tears ran down my face as I sat next to her and resisted the urge to hold her hand. Instead, just electing to sit and try to talk to her. Hey, Lulu. It's Arthur. Yeah, I'll come back once again to help pick up your goofy ass. I giggled, sniffing hard at our own lame attempts to downplay her debilitating illness. You know, you really scared me today. I thought I, I thought I was going to lose you. Pulled out some of the notes in my pocket and figured it would make good conversation while I waited for the neurologist. I found these notes while I was getting your things. I wish I'd known just how bad things had gotten. But I was so busy working, I didn't see the signs. I'm so sorry, Lucy. I felt the lump in my throat as I fought back to you. 
Never be sorry when a deal can be made, Vessel. Words fail to truly encapsulate what happened next. But I'll make a meager attempt. I saw it slinking around on all fours from beneath her bed at first. A hulking dark mass of shifting substances. Jagged thick limbs ending in hooves, carefully planted, and the mass tensing as it began to rise from the other side of the bed. A humanoid torso rose. I swear that had anyone else seen what I'd seen, madness and death would have permeated that hospital. It defied logic and reasoning, but I couldn't look away. A hairy male torso with the spine protruding towards me, and two amorphous arms jutting out of their sockets and pressing on the back as the head, oh God, the head, snapped forward to look at me. The skull was a creature resembling a deer, with flecks of black flesh hanging off the bone, white orbs beaming in the sockets, and antlers made from the arms of a human protruding from either edge of it, muscle and sinew showing through, as if it was in the process of shedding. I wanted to wrench, to scream, to throw my body over Lucille's, but I was transfixed. Your bondmaid made a choice with the grains of sand she had left in her hourglass. She elected to boost her limited understanding. The voice was smooth and almost disarming in nature. I was terrified to my core, but enraptured by every syllable. You may still save her, vessel, but is that what she wants? It cocked its head to the side and stared at us both. A question ringing out in my head for a few moments afterwards, as flashes of Lucille and I in better days went through my mind. Her knack for exploration, love of art and her laughter, all jostling for position in my head before I snapped back. Why wouldn't she want to be here, with me? What kind of question is that? Terror gripped me, but grief is a powerful motivator. Can you save her or not? What do I need to do? It dug its claws into one of the antlers, as if thinking before replying slowly. I can, but suffering awaits. The response rang out, and it gave no further elaboration, save for pointing at her and saying, She must wear the crown. And then pointing to me, adding, You must bear the guilt. A small, lamprey-like creature appeared from the neck of this fringe god, and he pulled it off, the shrill cry ripping into my ears, as many eyes and teeth felt immediately locked onto me. She will be saved, but your guilt will be eternal, vessel, he reiterated, holding out this parasite that was pulling at his emaciated digits to get to me. Do you accept the gift? Do you pledge yourself to the fringe? I swallowed and nodded, reaching out to take whatever the fuck is in his hand. But the antlers grabbed me first, pulling me over the bed and deep into this monstrosity's eyes. Show me solidarity first, vessel. Earn your seat at my table. And in that moment... It was as if he was never there. Like I'd snapped awake from some unexpected nap. Groggy, I looked around and cast my eyes towards my wife. She was staring right at me. Horror stricken across her face. And she began to open her mouth wider and wider. Unblinking as she did so. Her eyes rolled into the back of her head. As a cacophony of screams erupted from her and her body began to jerk violently. It was on a different scale than any seizure I had ever witnessed from her previously, and before I even had a chance to react, her nurses ushered me out and took over. She carried on seizing for the next ninety hours. No matter what anyone did, she would persist. Her body was riddled with bruises, and her vocal cords by this point were long since ruptured. A whispering yelp, all she was able to muster. 
Her body began to fail her on the fifth day, and while she was contorting into horrific positions for her body to attempt to support, her strength was failing rapidly, and the doctors were able to restrain her with greater ease. The neurologists were stumped. Experts across the U.S. had no concrete idea, and the sole consensus they could come to was that the tumour was now pressing more into her brain, and the seizures would not cease without risky surgery. They gave me time to think it over, of course, letting me sit with her again now that she was in a more sedated state, though I was terrified to do so. Before going in, I resolved to try and sleep in the adjacent waiting room. Having not received any proper news or resolution since this began, I now felt a degree of weight had been lifted, that if I was going to see my wife for potentially the last time, it would do me good to do so with a clear mind. I don't know if you'd call it a dream or a nightmare, but what I saw in that space was more vivid and tangible than anything that had come before it. I was your typical dreamer, barely remembered my experiences unless they were emotionally driven or traumatic. But this was on a whole new level, and I can still remember the way it looked, smelled, and even felt on my skin as I floated. I dare not go into detail here. I fear that may break the pact I now have with the fringe god. I will say that my wife was right in her notes. She did not do it any justice. I only had glimpses of the gate she stood in front of. Both were shut to me, and lumbering Goliath stood on either side, bearing down on me as I floated aimlessly, unsure of how to proceed. Once again, the fringe god appeared in front of me, leaning forward as he spoke. Your pact is about to be complete, Vessel. Are you prepared for the hardships ahead? Are you ready to worship? As he finished, the gate opened up just enough for me to see my wife behind it. A smile broke through the fog in my mind and put me at ease in a way I never thought I'd experience again. Without thinking, I nodded. Whatever it takes to free her, I'm ready, I replied, resolute. Then the pact is sealed. I will allow you to say goodbye before the traversals begin on the next lunar cycle. He extended an antler, and I begrudgingly gripped it. Why would I need to say goodbye here? I asked. The fringe god shook his head. Not here. Your guilt begins now. I lied to her. I lied to myself. I lied to you. I'm sat in the waiting room. And I can feel the sheer weight of my sins bearing down on me like a freaking lead weight on my shoulder or a leech attached to my neck growing fat and engorged on every black mark from my life. The hardest part of watching someone you love die slowly is never knowing when to let go. Living in a perpetual state of agony and wondering if this is your last day eating breakfast, your last ever I love you, or your last ever kiss. Everything mundane becomes ecstasy. You savour those quiet moments when you're not stressing over medication, palliative care or or what your life will be like in the lack long after. Lucio loved, loved her art. She loved creating fantastical monsters she could immerse herself in, and I adore creating and building those worlds as an architect and designer. We bonded over that love of the weird and unusual so many years ago, and it was what kept us strong through those darker days. Even now, its influence can be felt through every word you see upon this recount of events. I didn't just time her seizure because I knew it could be a mild one. I did it because I was determined to make sure, if she died, it was in her home and in my arms. With dignity. I must deal with that blame for the rest of my life, and every time I look in the mirror... I see the fringe god staring over my shoulder and reminding me of what I did 
reminding me of my sins. Lucille is on life support in the next room, and as soon as I finish this documentation, this confession, I'll do the merciful thing and let her go. I will hold her hand, kiss her forehead, and hold those post-it notes tightly as she slips away and falls into the realm she was so desperate to stay in. It is the right thing, no matter the cost of my sin. Maybe I'm at peace with it because I know that this was an inevitability, that blaming myself is exactly what any widower of a terminally ill loved one would do, that my timing was at its core just standard practice, regardless of my selfishness. Maybe it's because I know she was a passionate believer in dying with dignity, and she fought tooth and freaking nail to stay alive as long as she could. Or maybe it's because when I slept last night after I'd said my goodbyes, I saw her in that indescribable realm, smiling at a distance with the nocturnal one's arm protectively draped over her shoulder. The obelisk of Sonda was my sole means of emotional communication between us as I sat in the Stygian void between the dream world in the realm she now inhabits. Maybe I know that the good days, when I catch her smile shining off the horizon, are worth every ensuing night terror that springs forth unspeakable creatures that threaten to tear me from my fringe god, to tempt me to their realms with promises of forbidden desires as they torture every corner of my mind. All that I know is that I'll go to sleep tonight, and I will once again see her. Whether it's real or not doesn't matter. My fringe god fulfilled his end of the pact. Now it's my turn to do the same. The chateau into which my valet had ventured to make forcible entrance rather than permit me, in my desperately wounded condition, to pass a night in the open air, was one of those piles of commingled gloom and grandeur which have so long frowned among the Apennines, not less in fact than in the fancy of Mrs. Radcliffe. To all appearance, it had been temporarily and very lately abandoned. We established ourselves in one of the smallest and least sumptuously furnished apartments. It lay in a remote turret of the building. Its decorations were rich, yet tattered and antique. Its walls were hung with tapestry and bedecked with manifold and multiform armorial trophies. Together with an unusually great number of very spirited modern paintings in frames of rich golden arabesque. In these paintings, which depended from the walls not only in their main surfaces, but in very many nooks which the bizarre architecture of the chateau rendered necessary, in these paintings my incipient delirium, perhaps, had caused me to take deep interest, so that I bade Pedro to close the heavy shutters of the room, since it was already night to light the tongues of a tall candelabrum which stood by the head of my bed, and to throw open far and wide the fringed curtains of black velvet which enveloped the bed itself. I wished all this done that I might resign myself, if not to sleep, at least alternately to the contemplation of these pictures, and the perusal of a small volume which had been found upon the pillar, and which purported to criticize and describe them. Long, long I read, and devoutly, devotedly, I gazed. Rapidly and gloriously, the hours flew by, and the deep midnight came. The position of the candelabrum displeased me, and, outreaching my hand with difficulty, rather than disturb my slumbering valet, 
I placed it so as to throw its rays more fully upon the book. But the action produced an effect altogether unanticipated. The rays of the numerous candles, for there were many, now fell within a niche of the room which had hitherto been thrown into deep shade by one of the bedposts. I thus saw, in vivid light, a picture all unnoticed before. It was the portrait of a young girl, just ripening into womanhood. I glanced at the painting hurriedly, and then closed my eyes. Why I did this was not at first apparent, even to my own perception. But while my lids remained thus shut, I ran over in my mind my reason for so shutting them. It was an impulsive movement to gain time for thought, to make sure that my vision had not deceived me, to calm and subdue my fancy for a more sober and more certain gaze. In a very few moments, I again looked fixedly at the painting. That I now saw aright, I could not and would not doubt. For the first flashing of the candles upon that canvas had seemed to dissipate the dreamy stupor which was stealing over my senses, and to startle me at once into waking life. The portrait, I have already said, was that of a young girl. It was a mere head and shoulders, done in what is technically termed a vignette manner, much in the style of the favourite heads of Sully. The arms, the bosom, and even the ends of the radiant hair melted imperceptibly into the vague yet deep shadow which formed the background of the whole. The frame was oval, richly gilded and filigreed in moresque. As a thing of art, nothing could be more admirable than the painting itself. But it could have been neither the execution of the work, nor the immortal beauty of the countenance, which had so suddenly and so vehemently moved me. Least of all, could it have been that my fancy shaken from its half-slumber, had mistaken the head for that of a living person. I saw at once the peculiarities of the design, of the vignetting, and of the frame, must have instantly dispelled such idea, must have prevented even its momentary entertainment. Thinking earnestly upon these points, I remained, for an hour perhaps, half sitting, half reclining, with my vision riveted upon the portrait. At length, satisfied with the true secret of its effect, I fell back within the bed. I had found the spell of the picture in an absolute lifelikeliness of expression, which, at first startling, finally confounded, subdued, and appalled me. With deep and reverent awe, I replaced the candelabrum in its former position. The cause of my deep agitation being thus shut from view, I sought eagerly the volume which discussed the paintings and their histories. Turning to the number which designated the oval portrait, I there read the vague and quaint words which follow. She was a maiden of rarest beauty, and not more lovely than full of glee. And evil was the hour when she saw, and loved, and wedded the painter. He, passionate, studious, austere, and having already a bride in his art, she, a maiden of rarest beauty, and not more lovely than full of glee, all light and smiles, and frolicsome as the young form, loving and cherishing all things, 
hating only the art which was her rival, dreading only the palette and brushes and other untoward instruments, which deprived her of the countenance of her lover. It was thus a terrible thing for this lady to hear the painter speak of his desire to portray even his young bride. But she was humble and obedient, and sat meekly for many weeks in the dark, high turret chamber, where the light dripped upon the pale canvas only from overhead. But he, the painter, took glory in his work, which went on from hour to hour, and from day to day. And he was a passionate and wild and moody man, who became lost in reveries, so that he would not see that the light which fell so ghastly in that lone turret withered the health and the spirits of his bride who pined visibly to all but him. Yet she smiled on and still on, uncomplainingly, because she saw that the painter, who had high renown, took a fervid and burning pleasure in his task, and wrought day and night to depict her who so loved him, yet who grew daily more dispirited and weak. And in sooth, some who beheld the portrait spoke of its resemblance in low words, as of a mighty marvel, and a proof not less of the power of the painter than of his deep love for her, whom he depicted so surpassingly well. But at length, as the labor drew nearer to its conclusion, there were admitted none into the turret for the painter had grown wild with the ardour of his work, had turned his eyes from the canvas merely, even to regard the countenance of his wife. And he would not see that the tints which he spread upon the canvas were drawn from the cheeks of her who sat beside him. And when many weeks bad passed, and but little remained to do, save one brush upon the mouth and one tint upon the eye. The spirit of the lady again flickered up as the flame within the socket of the lamp. And then the brush was given, and then the tint was placed. And, for one moment, the painter stood entranced before the work which he had wrought. But in the next... While he yet gazed, he grew tremulous and very pallid, and aghast, and crying with a loud voice, This is indeed life itself, turned suddenly to regard his beloved. She was dead. So that really was a weird and wonderful collection of stories, wasn't it? Um, don't really know how to describe that. Hope um, a lot of you managed to fall asleep, which of course completely negates the point of me <laughs> doing this outro, doesn't it? If you're asleep, you're not going to listen to what I'm saying here. You'll have no idea what I've said. Oh, what a shame. Anyway, more important business. Tonight's collection of stories is dedicated to the one and only Mr. Christopher Maxim. The first story in tonight's collection was written by him, and um, this whole situation has hit him pretty badly. Um, brilliant writer, um, unfortunately he's not writing at the moment, but he's been a very, very good friend to a lot of us in the horror community. He's written some incredible stories, like the one you listened to to begin with tonight. And as I said, he's not going through the best of times, so if 
if you have anything to spare, please look at the link I've left in the video description and send a little bit his way. He's um, suffering quite badly at the moment. And as I said, he's done a lot for us in the horror community. So hopefully I can repay all of his um, fantasticness a little bit if you can just send a little bit of money his way. It would really help him out a lot, okay? Well, guys, um, if you're asleep, sweet tree. -da 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 -da. <laughs> and if you're still with me, I'll be back again tomorrow night with something phenomenal, as always, of course. Till then, my dear friends, very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye.